I want to take a moment to introduce our first speaker this morning. Jim McKay is Director of Prevent Child Abuse West Virginia, a project of Team for West Virginia Children, and serves as Policy Director for the National Alliance of Children's Trust and Prevention Funds. Jim has helped fund and lead various initiatives to improve the lives of children in West Virginia, including the Our Babies Safe and Sound campaign, Circle of Parents West Virginia, the West Virginia ACES Coalition, the West Virginia State Task Force on Preventing Child Abuse, and the West Virginia Legislative Action Team for Children and Families. He is also a member of the National Child Abuse Coalition. Jim is a well-regarded speaker who has presented workshops and keynote presentations at statewide conferences in Alabama, Idaho, Iowa, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, West Virginia, and Wisconsin, as well as the National Conference on Child Abuse and Neglect, the National Strengthening, Strengthening Family Summit, Prevent Child Abuse America, and Zero to Three. Previously, Jim was director of Time Out Youth Shelter, a crisis shelter for runaway youth in Huntington, and director of operations for the West Virginia Education Alliance. Promoting private support for public education, Jim served as legislative assistant to the Speaker of the West Virginia House for three years. Jim received his bachelor's degree in political science from Tennessee Tech University. His proudest achievement is being father to his sons, Jake and Jonah. Please help me by welcoming Mr. McKay virtually this morning, and I'm gonna hand it over to you, Jim. Thanks so much, Melody. Thanks everybody for, for joining us. I'll go ahead and get the uh, PowerPoint shared here. Um, and uh, if you want to, I think on Zoom, you can, you can uh, resize to, to even out if you want to click that and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, the work of the West Virginia ACES Coalition, Adverse Childhood Experiences, um, and uh, introduce uh, for those of you who, who aren't um, yet aware uh, some of the work of our Connections Matter initiative uh, with uh, my colleague and, and good friend uh, Barb Tucker, who's going to share um, uh, following my presentation about some of that work. Um, what we have, um, when, when we talk about uh, adverse childhood experiences and um, their impact, we, we just know that what happens in early childhood can really matter for an entire lifetime, both the positive experiences and the negative experiences. Uh, and, and particularly during the sensitive early periods of development, our brain architecture is really being is most open to this influence. And what we do in those earliest years um, really makes a difference. And so the conditions that the children live in makes a difference and um, what occurs and what happens. Again, not just the negative, because we want to uh, counterbalance the negative experiences that, that may happen for a child with positive experiences. Uh, before I dig in, we do have a poll question. I know, you know we've done a lot of conversations around the state about adverse childhood experiences. Uh, we're going to talk today about the uh, prevalence of ACEs in West Virginia, as well as some uh, concrete strategies to uh, prevent ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Uh, but if, uh, Melody, if you could throw up the poll, we'll just take a look and see, um, you know, what's your basic level of understanding on this topic? Do you, do you think you're completely green? Uh, for those who are just joining by phone, I'll read off the options. I have some basic knowledge, I have a solid background, or I really got this and I'm an expert. Um, if you could go ahead and vote right now, we'll see what comes in. Um, you can also use the chat box throughout the uh, webinar to, to share uh, input as well. Melody, I can't see the responses coming in, so I'll, I'll let you uh, tell me what they're looking like. It is showing that we've got about 50% of the people who have some basic knowledge, about 40% have a solid background, and about 70% are completely green, and 1% says they're an expert. So right in the middle. Most people are right in the middle, Jim. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate everybody being on. Hopefully this will be informative. We do have um, a lot of content, so I'm gonna go through the uh, uh, content here. Um, the slide was uh, on there um, pretty quickly, but we do have um, 
you know, these slides are available and this is being recorded and we have additional resources on our ACES Coalition website, wvaces.org, uh, for anyone who would want to, to dig in a little bit deeper than what we have time to do in, in the next uh, 30 minutes or so that I'll be sharing. Um, when we look at ACES, and this is the information the infographic that I really like from the Center on the Developing Child from, from Harvard University. Um, you know, ACES, just the basics are that ACES stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And um, those experiences can, can be physical, emotional abuse, neglect, caregiver mental illness, household violence. Um, the original ACES study was back in the 90s by Kaiser Permanente. And what they found was that uh, a lot of the folks that they were seeing, this is an adult uh, health provider, um, fairly high income, these are people with health insurance and so forth, so not a what we would necessarily consider an at-risk population, but um, numerous uh, patients that had had uh, pretty serious health issues and challenges um, shared adverse childhood experiences. And so uh, from that, that's really was the catalyst for a lot of the research about the impact of ACEs on uh, adult health and well-being throughout the lifespan. And so uh, when we look at this, you know, the more adverse childhood experiences a child experiences, the more likely they are, there's a linkage uh, to poor academic achievement and also a number of uh, chronic health issues, including heart disease, diabetes, uh, substance abuse, and so forth. Um, the way this happens is that this, the ACEs, the adversity, or the toxic stress, if you will, which is um, really when, when uh, there's these adverse experiences and they're not buffered, again, by po positive experiences, when that stress, we, some stress is, is okay, but when it's unrelenting, it's basically the same as like revving your car all the time. And over time, that's gonna damage your engine. If we feel like we're always under stress and we have heightened uh, brain chemistry that's going on because we're in this fight or flight mode uh, for our brains, and Barb's gonna talk a little bit about the impact on our brains, that can really have a biological response over time. So we need to buffer that toxic stress so that it doesn't get under our skin and activate that stress response system that can have adverse uh, results. Um, so when we reduce the effects of ACEs and toxic stress, uh, there's a lot of different ways we can do that, and I'll get to some of those in a little bit more detail uh, shortly. Um, the other thing I want to mention, so the, the original ACEs study from the CDC and Kaiser Permanente identified 10 different adverse childhood experiences, uh, you know, loss of a parent, domestic violence in the home, abuse and neglect, but we know that there are all kinds of uh, adverse childhood experiences that go beyond 10 categories, just like there's more positive experiences that can buffer against that. So I really like this uh, diagram called a pair of ACEs, and actually it's been updated to some degree with uh, the, the reality of our COVID-19 pandemic um, that, you know, really looks not just at adverse experiences within our family, but also the adverse community environments that are the roots under which the adverse childhood experiences, the adversity for childhood in our families uh, is more likely to occur. So from those adverse community environments of poverty, discrimination, uh, lack of opportunity and, and economic insecurity, poor housing, when you have those types of environments, then you're more likely to have uh, realized the types of uh, categories of ACEs when we think of getting your ACE score and reporting that. So I just want to, you know, put that in context. So often we tend to look just at the individual family level and miss the community context in which that family lives. And when we're talking about prevention, we really need to look across the social ecology. Uh, another factor I want to mention is that ACEs and, and uh, the connection to bias. We know that when you're talking about how many adverse childhood experiences and whether, um, you know, what my score is, that there is built into the ACE score some institutionalized and structural racism. 
we know that black, indigenous, and people of color are far more likely to be affected by mass incarceration. We know that poverty is more widespread. We know that um, institutional racism and, and actions like redlining, where certain aspects, certain parts of communities um, were uh, black and in, uh, in particular people were uh, prohibited from owning property and the impact of those uh, discriminatory practices in turn uh, leads to that community, you know, those roots of, of challenges of, of the community level ACEs. And so sometimes when we're looking at what our ACE scores are across a geography, across zip codes and so forth, it ends up looking like a redlining map where the highest uh, challenged areas are also the areas that have had most discrimination. So I uh, just want to lift that up. Um, and particularly now as we're uh, increasing and it's an overdue conversation about the impact of structural racism, um, but for us to achieve our, our goals where all children in West Virginia can thrive in communities uh, and, and success, then we need to know, look specifically at the racism that's affecting our black, indigenous, and people of color uh, and, and more likely to affect them. So we wanna lift that up and, and recognize that it's a score that um, is more than just a number, uh, that these are people and there's a lot to this. Hope that's making sense. Uh, it, Please uh, let me know if there's uh, chats and stuff I'm, with the slide. I'm hard to hard to kind of follow both of that. The other factor uh, related to this kind of area is we oftentimes, and I've used this myself, we talk about social determinants of health. And uh, Dr. Sarah Watamura, who's uh, done a lot of, I saw her presentation at the Aspen Institute. She's in Colorado, just a brilliant uh, researcher. She uh, has actually talked about that instead of calling social determinants of health, which we often think of ACEs as being a determinant of health, uh, that actually these are health consequences of structurally embedded inequities. We know that uh, ACEs are not equitably distributed across our state. Uh, we know that power and resources are not equitably distributed across our state, uh, that there is unequal distribution of that and it is distributed differently along the lines of race, gender, class, sexual orientation, gender expression, and other dimensions of individual and group identity. So uh, just encourage us. I, I've been trying to switch this uh, conversation, this language uh, around social determinants of health, which feels like okay, I have this, uh, my zip code, I was born here, I, I've got uh, a hand tied behind my back and therefore I'm not successful. Well, that's a reflect, it shouldn't be a reflection on me, it's a reflection on our community and our community's choices that have resulted in the structural embedded inequity and how do we make different choices to dismantle that inequity and so that we don't have those same health consequences. So looking at ACEs in West Virginia, uh, this is our ACEs report published by uh, the West Virginia ACEs Coalition. I uh, was proud to be the lead author on this and we have, uh, it's the full PDF uh, and the executive summary are available on the West Virginia ACEs website. Uh, if you go to the resources tab, uh, you can see uh, what's there. We also have training and other things that, that Barb's gonna mention available on wbaces.org. Um, what we did in following the lead of over 25 other states, uh, we looked at the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance uh, Survey, BRFIS, uh, fun acronym to say. Uh, so the BRFIS data is what we look at that tells us our adult smoking rates, uh, depression, mental illness, uh, other health factors, and the state of West Virginia uh, used uh, the CDC's approved uh, ACEs module, Adverse Childhood Experiences module, to ask uh, participants to tell us what uh, about their childhood experiences so that we could analyze those and compare them to their outcomes for uh, adult health. Um, the report begins with some basics about ACEs and, and what the science tells us. And, and just quickly, uh, this, this graphic shows, it's called the, the ACEs pyramid, uh, that when you have these adverse childhood experiences, also adverse community experiences, that 
over time that can disrupt our neurodevelopment, our brain chemistry, uh, which after, uh, as that continues, can have a negative impact on our social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. As we're dealing with that uh, emotional impairment, we become more likely to adopt risky health behaviors um, because we're trying to get by. And so we're more likely to uh, engage in heavy drinking, uh, substance use, and, and other factors, uh, less likely to get good sleep, and, and just a, a variety of, of uh, risk behaviors increase in their likelihood. Um, as those increase, then we tend to have more disease, disability, uh, social challenges. And if you have enough of those, you know, unfortunately, you, you die early. And this is really is about life and death, um, but it is not a determinative thing. We, we, uh, we always want to make sure that, you know, as I said in the, the title of this uh, report, it's about a stumbling block or a stepping stone. We know that ACEs can have a negative impact but how can we buffer those negative experiences with positive experiences so that they can uh, help us and we can still succeed. So looking at the data uh, for West Virginia, um, we have um, you know, about 55% have one or more ACEs. Again, these are going to the, the categories from the CDC's uh, documentation of that. You can see uh, uh, about uh, uh, the, 13.8% have four or more ACEs, which is really linked with higher uh, rates of health challenges and so forth. Uh, the types of ACEs, the most common was substance use in the home. Again, this is prior to, this is adults answering the survey, thinking back to their childhood before they turned 18, and these are West Virginia numbers as of 2014. Um, West Virginia has collected uh, more subsequent data that is still being analyzed, and we're, we're eager to see uh, the, the impact here. Um, one that's important to our work with Prevent Child Abuse West Virginia is sexual abuse. And uh, we can see that this was uh, one in 10, 10.1% of uh, adults in West Virginia reported some form of sexual abuse prior to their 18th birthday. So one in 10 West Virginians and uh, just a tremendous uh, uh, challenge that comes with that. Uh, you know, 7.7%, .7%, which is quote unquote, the lowest number on here, are had a household member who was incarcerated. Uh, so that's someone who's le you know, been pulled from their home, been incarcerated for some period of time. Um, uh, just a huge impact of, of these uh, results. And again, going back to the earlier comment about bias, we can see that you know, um, with mass incarceration, um, certain uh, demographics are gonna be more likely to be affected. And so we need to address those systemic issues as well. Uh, looking at the, cor the uh, correlation with, not necessarily causation, but the correlation with uh, impacting of, of physical health. Uh, so these are different categories, reported fair or poor health. Um, you can see the, the bar graph here is a zero. ACEs reported one ACE, two ACE, three ACE, or four or more ACEs. And uh, what this means, so for obesity, which we've done a lot of physical activity, we've talked about food uh, security and so forth, but when we address obesity, that's also a key issue that's impacted by uh, ACEs. And of people who report having a body mass index of 30 or more, 41, almost 41% 41 of those who have obesity report having four or more ACEs. So that's a huge impact. Um, COPD, you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So we're not just talking about substance use disorder and those types of things. Asthma. So people who report having asthma, one in five West Virginians as adults who have asthma, 19.2% rounding, ha report having four or more ACEs. So for those of us who are working on the Asthma Coalition, how can our work go to buffer the impact of ACEs? Uh, mental health, poor mental health. <coughs> Excuse me. 31% uh, of those who report having poor mental health have four or more ACEs in West Virginia. Almost half of the people who um, ha report having depression as an adult, according to the 2014 Burfus, uh, 47% have 
four or more ACEs. One in three have diff uh, of people who report having difficulty making decisions uh, are that. Health risk behaviors of smoking, again, 44.2% uh, drinking is, a, is an interesting one. And I think uh, we had some conversation about this, uh, you know, listing as heavy drinking. Uh, some folks in West Virginia, I think, define heavy drinking differently. Uh, so uh, we're kind of interested to see how that goes. Binge drinking, again, uh, analyzing this data, more likely uh, to have higher ACEs. Um, this is the last uh, kind of uh, data set that I want to share uh, from West Virginia. These are, this is the household income, annual household income. So not individual income, but household. So you have two breadwinners in the home. Um, those whose household income is less than $15,000. So it's a very low, it's far, it's below the um, poverty level and other considerations. Nearly one in four homes, households that report having less than $15,000 in household income report having four or more ACEs. So um, it's just a, a huge impact. We know the impact of ACEs is profound. Um, nationally, the CDC uh, has been really advancing this work. Their CDC vital signs report, and I'll post the link when, during uh, it's also on the website for the West Virginia Aces.org. Um, this was a, a seminal report in November of 2019, and they uh, noted some of the health impacts of ACEs, and in particular, what the benefits of prevention would look like. If we prevent ACEs, according to the CDC, we could prevent nationally up to 21 million cases of depression nearly 2 million cases of heart disease, two and a half million cases of overweight. So, um, you know, just huge positive impact. We, uh, going through some of the other health conditions, again, this is from the Vital Signs Report and published in, uh, in, in multiple journals, uh, potential reduction in negative outcomes for depression, COPD, asthma, kidney disease, stroke, cancer, diabetes, um, health risk behaviors like smoking and drinking, and socioeconomic challenges of unemployment, less than a high school education, so that's your dropouts, no health insurance. So across the board, if we uh, address these ACEs and prevent their occurrence, we can have positive impacts. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip ahead uh, to get to the prevention side uh, and not in, intrude into Barb Tucker's uh, presentation, but again, the vital signs report shows that ACEs are common, they add up over time and can affect our health and outcomes, but when we prevent them, uh, we can help prevent poor health and life outcomes. So I keep mentioning prevention and I just wanna mention that, you know, while the number of ACEs we have increase our risk, we know from science, from research, that risk factors are not predictive there may be increased likelihood, but they are not causation. And the difference in why a risk factor is not a predictive factor is because of protective factors. And so that's, that's I love that quote from Dr. Carl Bell. Um, and we really try to always buffer against the negative with the positive. Um, so we use for, for Prevent Child Abuse West Virginia and other uh, prevention programs in West Virginia, in the, the child abuse prevention and child well-being area, use the Strengthening Families Protective Factors Framework from the Center for the Study of Social Policy. Uh, you get some additional information at strengthenfamilieswv.org. Uh, but real quickly, there's five protective factors uh, that are linked with better outcomes for children, parental resilience, maintaining social connections, which we'll talk further about, increasing knowledge of parenting and child development, having access to concrete support in times of need, and we've seen the challenges of that during the pandemic more so than, than ever before, and nurturing the social emotional competence of children uh, so that they are uh, helped to engage in uh, and have that nurturing connection with adults is, is a real key protective factor. Another aspect and, and really uh, exciting new research is coming out led by Dr. Bob Sagey, um, and who's a noted pediatrician and uh, 
Charlotte Brown and, and others, uh, Jeff Linkenbach, who some folks have, have met through West Virginia work that we've done, is this idea of health outcomes, health outcomes from positive experiences. So not just looking at adverse childhood experiences, but what are positive experiences. And they've done research that's available at positiveexperience.org um, that, that shows that actually it's more predictive what strengths a child has during their childhood. So they've identified these four pillars of hope, relationships with other children, with adults, through interactive activities. That's the number one thing we can do to support and buffer against childhood adversity. Secondly, the environment and how do we have access to housing, uh, living and playing and learning in safe places, having positive school or home environments. Engagement is the third pillar and social emotional learning. So again, just really exciting to see that, asking questions, not just about what happened that's a negative, but what are some strengths that you can build on um, and, and offering that. When we ask just what, and sometimes we've seen this as we try to become trauma informed and, and having discussions about, um, you know, what type of adversity happened and getting my ACE score. Uh, and I, I do, you know, I think all of us, when we first get this, like, okay, well, this is my ACE score. Wow. What does that mean? But we, we buffer it with these protective factors and realize, well, I had a positive adult. My grandfather was there when I needed him. You know, my dad was battling alcoholism, but we had neighbors that were there for us and were able to help us. We always had a, a house. We, uh, those types of positive experiences buffered against the negative experiences. Um, looking at other aspects of prevention. So how do we create these pillars of hope? Uh, Again, we, we've been uh, part of some work with the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. They've uh, done a lot of research about ACEs and what prevents them. And a lot of that is found through their Essentials for Childhood initiative, trying to create safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments for all children. Uh, and when we have those safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments, then uh, positive things are more likely to occur. The research they've conducted with Dr. Joanne Clevens and Dr. Melissa Merrick, who is now the CEO of Prevent Child Abuse America, we're excited to have her in that role. They've identified six strategies, and these are identified in the uh, Vital Signs Report and other reports from the CDC that are proven to prevent ACEs. And so this is, again, not just what I do in my family and how I'm trying to hold it together, but what are we, how do we create the community conditions? And that's where policy advocacy, those of you who know me know that that's my uh, passion is to advocate for transformation and policy change. And so these are the six policy areas of strategies that help prevent ACEs. Real quickly, uh, you know, the first kind of bucket is strengthening economic support for families, making sure they have family financial security, that we have family-friendly work policies um, that allow paid time off. We, we've seen our community come together to meet the needs of our families during the pandemic with working remotely and uh, taking flex time and different aspects like that. We shouldn't have to wait for a pandemic for those types of family-friendly policies to be in place. We need that economic security, those family-friendly work policies throughout especially as we come back from a pandemic. But for many families, they've, they've essentially had a pandemic situation. It's just been uh, beyond our broader understanding. So strengthening economic supports, promoting social norms that protect against violence and, and adversity. Uh, so that's where we get into our public education campaigns, trying to limit corporal punishment, uh, abusive physical uh, punishment for um, parenting and discipline styles. Uh, role of bystander approaches. Uh, I know we have folks from Frizz on here and we've been working on our child sexual abuse prevention and uh, violence on campus. The role of bystanders uh, to prevent uh, sexual violence is really key. Uh, men and boys as allies in prevention in that work. Um, ensuring uh, a healthy early start. So our home visiting programs, starting point centers, high quality pre-K, and childcare, uh, make sure you have a, a strong start. Uh, teaching skills is the fourth one. Uh, social emotional uh, learning, safe dating, healthy relationship, our boundary violations, make sure we, we have healthy boundaries. Parenting skills and family relationships. Um, 
connecting youth to caring adults and activities through mentoring activities, you know, just promoting that power of connection. And I'm really excited that Barb's going to dig into some concrete ways that we can do that through the Connections Matter initiative. And then uh, last but certainly not least is lessening harms and preventing future risk. And so this is where our child advocacy centers, our trauma-informed care, you know, when something bad happens, how can we buffer against that, have a uh, better practice, the safe at home uh, work that, that is going on, the Handle with Care initiative that Andrea Dar and the Children's Justice Task Force has done. You know, how do we make sure we have those types of uh, programs and, and strategies uh, widely available are another strategy to help prevent ACEs. Again, all this is through the CDC's research, but I wanted to, to lift it up. Um, we know that prevention happens in partnership whether it's a faith-based organization, our schools, our government, our business, our communities coming together, the legal system, our healthcare providers, uh, just our families in general. All of what we're working on to buffer against uh, a childhood adversity and to prevent that childhood adversity from occurring in the first place happens in partnership. So we're really excited about the partnership we have with the West Virginia ACES Coalition, we're four years into this uh, launch of this coalition. Uh, coalition has got now over 350 members. We would love for you to join us as part of that work with the West Virginia ACEs Coalition. Also through uh, my organization with Team for West Virginia Children and our Prevent Child Abuse West Virginia .org. You can you can learn more about our work there. Our network of partners and prevention teams across the state. And um, with that, I'm gonna. Uh, transition to uh, our next presenter. I think hand it back to Melody and uh, make sure we have some time for questions at the end. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jim. As Jim mentioned, we are going to provide time at the end um, of the session for questions. So please hang on to them and we will ask as many of them as we can. We also want to make sure that you have contact information for the speakers. So if you have follow up questions we don't get to, we'll make sure you have those answered. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Barb Tucker. Barb was born and raised on a small farm in southwestern in a southwestern Pennsylvania coal community, the youngest of six children. She left for West Virginia University in 1979 to earn her degree in agriculture horticulture. In 1983, she secured, secured a teaching position with Lewis County Schools in Weston, teaching agriculture education. From that, she pursued a master's degree in behavior disorders and emotional disturbances while teaching at the Lewis County Alternative Learning Center for 10 years. Although the job was rewarding and exciting every day, a change back to regular education came for the next 17 years, garnering new certifications and teaching physics, environmental science, and general science in middle school and high school. Nearing retirement, a job in special education at the elementary level came up and Barb finished her teaching career in that capacity. Directly following retirement, Barb was the supervisor of Lewis Upshur Parents as Teachers Home Visitation Program through the Lewis County Family Resource Network. Recently, the position of Region 7 Adolescent Health Initiative Coordinator became available, and Barb acquired that position to work with schools and communities to promote positive youth asset development through the state of West Virginia. It's my pleasure to introduce one of my counterparts, one of my favorite people. I'm going to hand it over to you, Barb. Hello. Good morning, everybody. So many familiar names in the chat. It's so exciting to see everybody. Um, before I get started, uh, Lori, if you'll add the link I just sent you, um, when Jim mentioned the, the social justice issues that, that we're now um, able to, to confront more openly, I, I, I need, I feel like I would be remiss not to add the social justice website from the West Virginia School, Associate, uh, School Psychologist Association. Some of you are familiar with um, another friend of ours and colleague, Britt Cooper. She's the chair of that committee. And when you go to the School Psychologist Social Justice page, um, not only has she listed all the support lines that so many of us need, uh, the Trans Lifeline, the, the Human Trafficking Hotline, I'm looking at my phone because I have the app up. Um, she also has listed in this particular time, Making History, How to Be an Ally. So there are links to um, the Trevor Project, supporting black LGBTQ youth mental health to week of action in defense of black lives. 
So if you, if you keep that website handy, she updates it monthly with books to read for kids. She's got a link to the Kids Count Data Center. She has a link. This book of the month is um, Andrea Davis Pinckney, Let It Shine, The Stories of Black Women Freedom Fighters. So it's another great resource for us. And it's not just for schools. Parents can use this. Anybody can use it. And it's a wonderful social justice link that we all um, we all need. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, have a conversation now with you about the things that um, the thing that I'm supposed to be talking about. So let me pull up my PowerPoint if I can. Um, I had uh, found out about ACES through several different different ways uh, several a few years ago. And um, what I <laughs> lost in the high weeds here. And um, what I had decided when I found out about ACEs is that I would be very uncomfortable discussing ACEs without also discussing resiliency. That to bring up, as, as Jim said, to bring up uh, ACEs with a group of people and then not have a conversation about resiliency was going to be really uncomfortable for me. Well, I waited and the ACEs Coalition brought in um, their Connections Matters initiative and I could not be more pleased to, to be one of the presenters for this. Connections Matters uh, talks literally about what connections do to the brain. And with that, what we realized through our research, not ours, but the research that's, that has been done, is that in order for us to create solid communities, we have to create solid brains in children. Brain development is what creates a solid person with resiliency and when we have that then they're able to are, are, are able to function build better communities but how do we do that well look at that third cog the third cog in that wheel is relationship building the research that's being done now and has been done over the last several years in brain development is so important to what we realize about resilient and healthy people building our healthy communities. Healthy brains, ready to learn and think. They're creating supportive relationships with people who can cope and can thrive. And then those strong communities are developed through that. The Connections Matters, um, and, and every slide that I'm showing you is from Connections Matters. This is a, um, uh, the initiative is so that we can get this information out to folks in communities who really need to hear it. A lot of us that are the a lot of the 199 of us on this uh, webinar today are aware of all this, but we've really got to spread this word. Some people in our communities don't understand why we're building re resiliency. What is it that we're doing in our daily jobs that help make the community stronger? So we have to get that information out. To build the future of our community, we've got to build the relationships. Mel, if you could put up our um, second poll question, please. Some of the folks that we, that we encounter every day um, don't understand that relationship building. So what we'd like to ask you, if you're comfortable answering this one, when you were a child, there was a person in my life, I've changed um, tenses or, or, or person placement. Um, was there a person in your life who made you feel better when you were sad and worried? Is that a true statement for you? Probably, not sure. Probably not true or definitely not true. And this question that, that we ask now is the essence of, of how, we, um, how we work through a Connections Matter session. Connections Matter session would, would pull a group of people together and we start really talking about uh, the relationships that individuals have had that have helped people uh, become resilient. So finding out and thinking about what your background is and, and, and did you have people to help? Like, I, I can name mine. I know exactly who they were in, in my childhood who were there when I was, was sad or worried. Sometimes it's family members, sometimes it's, it's relatives, community members, neighbors. Do we have any results on that one, Mel? Those of us on this call can see, um, and po probably not true, we have 4% that not true. So we can see that there's a, there's a variance on how people um, felt about having someone that they could go to 
to make them feel better. And when we say feel better, we, we mean really make them feel more secure, make them feel stable, make them feel like um, whatever the, the, the risk factor was that was uh, with them then, that they can get through it and they can thrive through it. Thanks, Mel. When we um, present a Connections Matters, what we do is help people, particularly in, as I said, in, the, um, in, in other roles, I would refer to that as lay people because most of us are in some kind of social service and most of us do understand uh, what's going on, but we wanna pull people in from the business community. I love to present this to boards of education because sometimes the folks on the board of education didn't have um, the background in, in um, information about the brain that we had. Um, I was so, 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 so happy to present this to CASA volunteers um, with Deb um, because when we have volunteers that come from other areas, they don't necessarily, they don't necessarily uh, know what we know. Once again, this is from um, the Center for, Child, for the Developing Child at Harvard that, that Jim had referred to earlier. Um, and I do want to play part of this because um, even... A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. So Connections Matters is a presentation that's available through the ACES Coalition around the state. And I want you to think about how you, could, how you could have a workshop for someone in your community or someone in your workplace, explaining connections through brain development with that simple video opens up an entire conversation about the strategies that we're using. Um, those of us in, in, in the professions that we're in, why are we doing what we're doing? Connections Matters allows us to open that up for a conversation with people that, that didn't necessarily know. We need to talk to people about the fact, just as Jim said, it, ACEs are part of, of um, whatever experience, positive and negative, um, everything is part of a child's development in their brain. We do not need to uh, pigeonhole people into, into what they're going to be, as he also had said, it's not correlation, uh, or it is, excuse me, it is correlation, it's not cause and effect, it's not causation. And we have to, to get people to understand that brains are plastic. What is developed can also be changed. Is it most important? Teachers, you guys know this, What's learned first lasts longest. Those first three years, it is so hard to undo what has been done, but is it impossible? No. Prevention, protective factors, and resiliency are what we have to discuss with our communities. What makes the connections? As we had just said, it's about the relationships. How important is that for us to get out to our communities, to our parents? 
volunteers. I, I love slash hate this particular slide, the to-do list at the bottom left, put down your smartphone and spend 15 minutes non-electric time with the child. That's an uncomfortable for, one for me, but it's so important. And then we need to talk about the adults too. We have adults in our community who are struggling. Jim just showed us um, the ACEs, you know, what adults are saying about their own ACE scores and their own resiliency. We've got to realize that adults are also able to uh, reconnect some of their brains. And how do we do that with them? Well, you know, eye contact. The way that we build uh, relationships is through trust. And how do we build trust? Eye contact, appropriate touch, which now is kind of tricky with COVID. And the last thing is time. And this goes back to that poll question that we asked. When you reflect back on um, the person, the people who, who made you feel safe, secure, or relieved your sadness or worry, what was it that they had done? They had built trust. And that trust was built through time, appropriate touch, eye contact, conversations. So what we need to get out into the community is for people to understand that, that if we're going to uh, provide help for people, we have to do that with providing trust, with, with developing trust. How do you do that? You build relationships. What we're looking for are folks who can adapt, thrive, and cope in difficult times. That's the resiliency piece. As Jim had said, and I agree, and people who know me know, uh, the resiliency piece is, is really that, that definition. Connections Matters also will explain to folks about um, upstairs, downstairs brain, and when um, Jim had referred to flight or fright responses. Uh, saying that every time because I also add freeze in, flight, fright, or freeze responses. Um, some folks don't understand, especially in this, well, those of us in the school system understand those responses, but when we're talking to people uh, in, the, in the community, we need to explain to them that we need school-based mental health because we have kids who function in their downstairs brain, and that is because that has been their revving of their constant engine and the things that trigger them within the classroom or within the, the, in the cafeteria. So when folks in the community are, are questioning why we bring in sensory rooms, why are we doing cool down rooms? Why do we have, uh, why are we teaching uh, breathing and yoga? And why are we teaching mindfulness? Some of our community members really need to understand that it's this upstairs downstairs, this Dan Siegel research that, we, that they need to understand. One of the other things that some folks don't understand in, um, uh, in the community is why we're teaching deep breathing. Um, I'm gonna run out of time, so I'm not gonna do this one. Teachers, you know Go Noodle, you know it. I'm pretty sure you love it, Maximo in his, in his poses. But teaching deep breathing years ago, uh, in, the, um, in the late 80s at the Lewis County Alternative Learning Center, we were teaching deep breathing and yoga and meditation and we got in a little bit of trouble because um, it was not appropriate at that time to call it that. Well, the brain science research wasn't there yet. What does deep breathing do? Deep breathing brings in the serotonin from the top of the brain to counteract the cortisol from the base of the brain. That's what deep breathing does. So it's actual brain science that, that we're teaching. Um, and now with that, with that support from the research group, we as practitioners can use these strategies. Connections Matters presentations are all about what the connection is one-to-one. -one. Um, this is Odell. Odell was hanging out in the park that was full of um, some uh, things that were, were not really family friendly. So what he did was create things that the people that were using that park needed. He created um, a senior citizen feeding group. He pulled in youth groups to help clean up. He, there were some drug exchanges going on and he figured out how he could help the, the dealers and, the, and some of the substance abuse, um, substance use disorder folks get the help that they needed and he cleaned up the park and he's a community organizer. That was Odell's connection to his community. And what we need to do is um, realize that, excuse me, is realize that the, those relationships that he was building 
That's what we need our community members to do and to see. We have so many already. We have so many people running food pantries now. We have so many people volunteering. Those are the connections. When, uh, when you go and do, if any of you are, have been involved in uh, food distribution, when you go and somebody shows up, they're like, oh, hey, I saw you last year. Or, hey, I saw you here. And if you have that food offering, sometimes they'll ask you for something else. I was able to go out and ask people in my community on the food run um, about their internet access. What's gonna help you when we go back to school? What's gonna help you with, with, with helping with the, the distance learning? A lot of times we talk about trauma and we talk about trauma as, um, um, and we, we have to talk about trauma as an experience. When we talk to, to communities about trauma, we have to recognize that what trauma is, is the reaction to the experience, not the experience itself. Some of us will go through the same event and be traumatized and others aren't. And that's because of those experiences that created the connections in the brain. When we do a, a Connections Matters training for anybody, we need to talk about that because not everybody understands. They do understand this piece. In the trainings, in the workshops, uh, we talk about things that might be difficult to discuss. But we have to have the difficult conversations in order to grow as a community. We also then talk about toxic stress on the, on, uh, the brain and its effect, the long-term effect, and from, um, from Harvard. We need to talk about the connections, big and small. This is a dentist, but please notice her connection that she feels is not about dentistry. It's not about great teeth and a beautiful smile. It's about encouraging Melissa. The science is now behind us to talk about the fact that the strengthening of, a, of an individual, just as Jim said with strengthening families, strengthening one individual strengthens the family. Strengthening one family can, can strengthen the neighborhood. Strengthening the neighborhood strengthens the entire community. So the little things that we are doing individually and out to have a huge impact. But the science research says that these little things that we're doing actually are brain development. We know this. Every child is one person away from resiliency. We just need to give our people in our communities the understanding and, and, and almost the permission to be that for somebody. We have to give them the tools, the words, the talking points, and the assurance that what they're doing to make connections is the right thing. We go through activities with them when we're in one of our workshops um, that encourage, encourages them to, to rebuild connections. Once again, what we're doing is trying to help people in communities understand that we as a community need to help people become resilient. It's no longer just the school system, mental health. It's the community in general. Uh, this is also another, another set of research um, out of Iowa, and it talks about um, the actual healing powers of relationships. And what you do, what can you do to increase this? Playing a, a rule-based game with young children, when I was teaching students with, the, um, with behavior disorders and dealing with their parents, is talking about you know, sharing a game. Candyland, shoot some ladders. Remember trouble and you'd land on them and you'd set them back? Teaching kids how to win, how to lose uh, well. Teaching kids that it's okay to make a mistake. Look at the adult piece of it too. When we build resiliency in adults, we're also helping them with physical health, mental health. And this is um, the, the, another slide about the two generation approach. We need to talk in communities about helping the entire family. So um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, my, my, one of my sisters taught at the Head Start there. Head Start there had a program where there, in fact, it's also it, and part of Connected Matters, the, the Tulsa Head Start had a program to educate um, the parents to, to increase. They could use the facility, the computers to get their GED, but also to take some online college classes. Because when you help one member of the family, it's exponential help if you help two members of the family. 
So we're looking at how we help parents become resilient also. What's the connection? This rabbis is to learn every kid, to get to know every child. Communities working together build the relationships. We have to open up. We have to, to, to release some of what we used to see as barriers and everyone doing their pigeonhole. We need to get together and develop common language to talk about trauma and resiliency. Taboo anymore. We have to have the opportunity. Connections Matters is a workshop, is an initiative that was brought to West Virginia from Iowa, uh, from Child Abuse, Child Abuse Prevention Iowa, Prevent Child Abuse Iowa, excuse me, to West Virginia. Uh, we were trained last spring and it is available for us to come to your community and have these conversations. Why? Because developing communities is safer. There's more success and we see increased physical and mental health. This is out of Washington. Um, so in Washington, they use the, the uh, approach of uh, ACEs, uh, understanding ACEs at a community level, and then um, community cooperation. Reduction, well, you can see the numbers. I don't need to read it to you. But once we get this information out and have clear conversations, then the connections start to build. When we do our workshops, we talk about specifically what is your connection in your community and how can you change it? For some of us, it's, it's, it's double fold, not one thing, it's several things. You happen to be a teacher, but you're also a scout leader. You work in mental health, but you also have a, a Girl Scout troop. Or you, um, your, your neighborhood, your yard is open for kids to come and play kickball. And then you happen to, you know, offer them popsicles at the same time with parent permission. So when we talk about Connections Matters through the ACES Coalition, um, you can request a training. We have two hour, four hour, and eight hour trainings. Um, there's conversation about it being virtual as we're all going to virtual things. That has not happened yet. It would be hard for those of you who have been in a session with me on anything, it would be really hard for me to do an eight hour session <laughs> without being face to face on things, but um, we are working, working towards that. The ACES website is listed in the, in the chat in the chat boxes, please go there. There's resources and once again, you can request a training in Connections Matters for your community. Um, I highly encourage you, encourage you to, because this is a, a presentation that allows you to have research brought to your community so that we can once again have a common language and um, really build some strong relationships with, with everybody for the good of our community. So that's all I have. I'm gonna um, send it back over to Mel so we can question and answer. Okay, okay, so now is an opportunity for you guys to put some questions in the Q&A box. If there are some in the chat box, I will take a look and, and direct it. If you have questions, now would be a time to put it in the Q&A box. Jim, there's a question about online um, connections matters from another, from another trainer. That has not been done yet. There's conversation happening about it, but um, it, is, it has not happened. Jim, can you, can you talk about that in the other states? Sure, so uh, West Virginia is licensed to do connections matter uh, and uh, Iowa has also expanded it to Georgia, uh, Prevent Child Abuse Georgia, Prevent Child Abuse North Carolina, and Prevent Child Abuse New Jersey are all also doing it. Uh, each of us is meeting about every month to kind of touch base about how we're transitioning in the time of this pandemic and social distancing. Um, so there's been some guidance there. Um, Georgia has done a, a version of it online with their training. Um, but it's it's still being worked out. Basically, uh, for those of you, I think, uh, Jennifer, you're as a trainer, um, what they're encouraging is at this point for us to do the awareness level of activities similar to this and then exploring ways to where they could do the two or four hour virtually. Um, Iowa is, is doing some pilot testing of that, but thus far has not had it um, connected or released out to us. Um, 
we know that we need to reconnect with our trainers. And so we're having some discussions about when we can get everybody on and see how um, Team for West Virginia Children, Prevention of East West Virginia, the ACES Coalition, all of us who are working to advance this work and, and uh, you and Barb are two of our star trainers. So we wanna support this expansion as much as possible. And if folks who are on this wanna have a Connections Matter training, please go to our wvaces.org. You can indicate a request for training and we'll do our best to, to try to connect the dots, um, but we're all kind of sorting this out together. Okay, Jim, I've got another one for you that popped up into the box. Are there any statistics that include removal from home as an ACE? Maybe a weighted ACE, or is that just considering the fact that removal would result from one or more ACEs, and there is, is there no good way to denote or specifically study the nuance of the effect of removal and how the four pillars of hope would impact removal? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Um, we don't have, you know, um, the ACE score per se to, to coincide with removals. Although, um, you know, if you have a removal, you're put into, if there's a substantiation of abuse or neglect, then that in of itself is an ACE. And again, there's different types of ACEs too, but that's one that's in the original categories as well. We know that, um, and one of the reasons we focus so much on prevention is the, Children do better in families, uh, nurturing, safe, strong families and environments. And so the more we can um, support those families and make that intervention of having to go to kinship care or foster care, you know, the outcomes there are, are not as great as we'd like. You know, that just even that is a trauma unto itself, uh, even if you're going to a very loving foster home and, and everything like that. It's, it's a traumatic experience. And so the more we can support families and make that less likely to occur, also support the foster families. You know, we, we're pleased to partner with the Foster Kinship Adoptive Parent Network led by Marissa Sanders. Um, you know, we, we need to do better for all that, but it's not necessarily quantified, but we definitely are looking at the outcomes of childhood adversity and how can we support uh, children who are involved with the child welfare system, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about what would be a, a child well-being system as opposed to child welfare, which is sometimes an adversarial kind of let's investigate the parents uh, who are having a rough time. How do we offset and reduce those stress on parents so that then they're more likely to succeed? So great question, and it's part of the ongoing work that, that we all have to do across our communities. Thanks, Jim. I have a couple more, but first, quick one, Barb. Can you once again refer and give them the name of that app that you spoke about earlier? I believe it was the Social Justice. So we have a question about that. Yes. Let me see. Um, uh, do, you want to, do you want to put that in the chat box for them? Um, I sent it to Lori. Lori, do you have that that one up again? It's West Virginia School Psychologists Association. So it's wvspa.org slash social justice. I'm pretty sure. Let me find it. We will also make sure that all the resources that have been shared with you today will come out in an email to you following the session. So know that. I'm going to ask this next question, but I'm going to say the answer is yes, yes, yes already. But the question is, would you recommend these trainings for professionals or parents? I'm a school counselor and I believe this would benefit them both. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yep. Yes. Um, even if, even, even within a school system, when I've done this, uh, when I've done the Connections Matters workshop, sometimes just having a whole day just to talk about brain development, but high school teachers, I, you know, I'm not going to say anything about teacher education, but a lot of us didn't have a class that really talked about brain development, or if we did, you know, we were 18, didn't really talk about what we need to talk about now. So these new developments in, in connecting brain development to resiliency, relationships, this is really kind of new and different information. Yes, parents need to, to hear it. Um, I will caution, though, when we talk to parents, there's a lot of... Um, of guilt if they feel that there's something that their child has, has experienced that was less than optimal. 
So we really got to be careful in some of the presentations um, that, we, that we really hit on the resiliency piece. There's a, a very humorous Barb Tucker formula of uh, surviving and thriving children that talks about, I made it up, so we really can't use it. But when you want a thriving child, every child, every person is pretty much divided by their factors of risk. But how do you, how do you, you know, my dear Aunt Sally told me that for multiplication, if I want, or for division, if I want to get rid of it, I got to multiply. So you got to multiply by, by times and times again, the protective factors. If we identify three risks, factors, well, let's flood that kid, flood them, flood them, flood them with 10 protective factors so that they can build those resiliency skills. One of the things we do in our, in our trainings for, um, in our workshops, there are these cards from the um, Community Resilience Initiative, one of the activities. We look at the ACEs in the cards, but then the participants are given resiliency cards and they list specific actions, actual behaviors, um, expressing feelings is a resiliency. Helping a child develop problem solving skills, that's a building block. Um, teaching self-discipline and, and the sense of responsibility. So when we talk to parents and they're concerned about, oh my gosh, what do I do? We're gonna tell them. The, these are your building blocks right here, and we're going to work with them. I see somebody, oh, the cards. Okay, so these cards, if you go to Community Resilience Initiative, um, they have these. This, is, this was part of Jim's four leaders, Walla Walla Washington, you know, that uh, Paper Tigers. He's kind of been involved with some of that. Um, that there's, a whole lot, there's a whole lot going on in resiliency, and um, there's also a poster of these cards available there, too. Jim? <laughs> I'm sorry. You have anything to add? Um, no, I was looking at trying to find some information about the obesity question that I saw in the chat. Sorry, I was, uh... <laughs> that's okay, Barb. If you can go ahead and put your email address into the box, somebody was asking oh. a question about scheduling a training and if there's a free a fee for presentation, so that way they can contact you. I do want to say to some of our participants, we appreciate you sharing resources in the chat box as well, because the more resources we have, the more information we all have, and that's a, that's a positive. Are there any more questions that I can put out to our presenters in either box? Well, is there anything that you would like to add, Jim or Barb, before we say goodbye and reminder to our graduate credit uh, participants who are interested to please remain on for 30 minutes after we close up here so you can get that information. But I'll let our two presenters add anything if they would like to. Thanks, Melody. Uh, yeah, so I, I just posted in the chat box a, a link to aces2high.com, which is a great, also another great resource for um, ACEs related information, but it's got some of the history. There was a question in the chat about obesity and linkage to child sexual abuse. That's actually how the ACEs study began in the 90s was kind of by accident where uh, the researcher at the obesity clinic, Dr. Paletti, was asking about age of your first sexual contact. He, he misread a survey question about sexual activity and did it a couple of times, made the same mistake in his question and realized that uh, there was this commonality for folks who were struggling with the obesity clinic and uh, gaining weight again. And, and he, he tells the full story. We can get additional resources, but, you know, people lost a lot of weight and then there was a triggering event, a cat call or something like that. And suddenly they went, they relived their trauma from childhood when they'd been sexually abused. They started um, self-medicating through food and other behaviors. Also, uh, you know, there's some evidence that it's a protective factor because if uh, someone feels like they're not conventionally attractive, uh, which is also a, a flawed thinking, but uh, that the food and the, the eating habits and obesity um, can, can be all intermixed around that child sexual abuse trauma. So there's a lot there. Uh, again, each, each of these, also the, um, the opioid epidemic, uh, victims of child sexual abuse, male victims of child sexual abuse. Uh, there's some evidence if you have six or more ACEs, you're 46 more times, 46 times more likely, not 46% more likely, 46 times more likely to be an intravenous drug user. So a lot of that is in our ACEs, uh, West Virginia ACEs study and, and available 
uh, through the resources. So uh, I'll stop there, but I uh, really appreciate this uh, invitation to be part of this work. Again, please join the West Virginia ACES Coalition. We would love to have you uh, be part of our work and uh, I'm glad, glad to be here with Barb and, and the rest of the, the crew. It's a, it's, a good, it's a good connection for all of us, because guess what? Connections matter. Thank you to the both of you. I greatly appreciate you taking the time this morning to share this really important information. Again, as Jim said, there is a ton of information and resources on the ACES Coalition website. Great film if you've never seen Resilience. Wonderful way to introduce people to this topic in just a little over an hour film. And it has actually a guide that goes along with it that Mr. McKay was a part of creating as well. Tons of resources. That was the intention of us creating this training series was to not only provide information, but to provide additional resources and linkage to professionals that deliver these types of presentations. So that if you're interested in bringing them to your community and schools, you have those contacts. This is that point in time where I wanna be aware and uh, respectful of your time. So we're going to end today, the first in a series of four next week. You're stuck with me presenting. We're gonna talk about developmental assets. We're gonna talk about the Adolescent Health Initiative Program, where it came from, how we started, the premise of our work. If you have not been introduced to Search Institute's work before, they were the forefront of adolescent development and building relationships with youth. So we're going to talk about strategies, why it's so important next week. So I hope that you will join me next week um, and participate. Reminder to make sure you get your names on the sign-in sheet. You will have an evaluation email to you as well. We ask that you please make sure you get your name on the sign-in sheet, check the box that applies to you, and fill out an evaluation so we can share that with our presenters and we can all grow as we move forward. If you are participating in the graduate credit course or you're just simply wanting to get more information, I'm going to hand it over to Selena Vickers here in just a moment. We are so happy for those of you who are joining us for the first time today. And for those of you that are joining us again, welcome back. We will see you next week. Thank you so much.